Hello and welcome to United with Christ. My name is Cheryl Colasar and today's topic is fruitful in suffering. Stay tuned, be right back and we'll get into the talk. United with Christ. Meet local churches with open doors serving throughout the Border Valley community and sharing the truth and hope of God's love and salvation. A presentation of Life Christian Broadcasting Television. And now, United with Christ. Hello and welcome to United with Christ. My name is Cheryl Colasar and today's topic is Fruitful in Suffering. What is your story, dear friend? We all have a story. I recently heard a story about one of the, my favorite principals from high school, and he passed away unexpectedly, and his son ended up being a homeless gentleman here in El Paso somewhere. If you see him without a leg and with a dog roaming the streets around here, you will know that his father was a dearly beloved principal from my high school. He has a story, you have a story. When you walk by people in Walmart, when you go to the restaurant, everybody you walk by has a story. And a lot of their stories include suffering. You, my friend, have been, your story has included suffering. I wanna to talk today about a story of a young man named Joseph. Joseph is an, a man who experienced incredible suffering. He was dearly beloved by his father, but he was hated by his brothers. He had 12, there were 13 of them total, one sister, and there were 11 siblings, and his brothers hated him, probably because his dad loved him so much. And his, he actually had a dream as well that he was going to bow down, that his brothers were going to bow down to him. And of course, that infuriated, infuriated them even more. So one day they came up with a plan. They decided that they would take Joseph and they would put him in a pit. They were going to kill him. But eventually they, you know, reevaluated their plan and decided they would just sell him to some traveling salesmen that were on their way to Egypt. So they sold him to some traveling salesmen and they took his coat of many colors that his father had given him and they covered it with the blood of a goat. And they took it to their father and said, look, your son Joseph has been killed. I'm so sad. Sorry, dad. Of course, Jacob was devastated. Joseph is now on his way to Egypt. Joseph's story doesn't end there. He ends up being hired by Potiphar, being sold into slavery, hired by Potiphar. And he was so amazing at administration that he rose to the top of Potiphar's household. Well, Potiphar's wife noticed him and she tried to get him to come be with her. And of course, Joseph was a man of integrity. Through a series of unfortunate events, Potiphar's wife accused him of attacking her and he landed himself in prison where he stayed for the next 12 years. But because Joseph was a man of integrity, a man of character, a man of administrative skills, he rose to the top once again in the prison. At the end of his time in prison, we see that he was moved through a series of events that were orchestrated by God through the divine uh, power that God gave him to interpret the dream of Pharaoh, he ended up coming out of prison and being put second in command to Pharaoh himself. There was a famine in the land and he was the one who filled up the, the, the storehouses with so much grain that there was so much he could, didn't even have to keep count anymore. There was so much that he didn't even keep record and he was prepared for the famine that soon hit the land. And guess who shows up on his doorstep? You got it. It was his brothers. They, they came all the way from their land with their father, Jacob. They left him at home and their father said, go get some grain. So they came. They did not know that they were talking to their, their brother, Joseph. But Joseph, of course, gave them the grain. And through a long series of events, they finally realized it was Joseph. And they bowed before him, just like the dream that Joseph had when he was a little boy. They bowed before him. Joseph did not, did not stand in bitterness and resentment, but instead he welcomed them with loving open arms and invited all of the rest of the family to come and join him there in Egypt. And they were able to build their family, build their, their uh, culture, build their descendants, and the family of Joseph and Jacob and all of their descendants grew into the nation of Israel. There were so many, so many Israelites in Egypt that the king began to forget about who this Joseph was and why all these people were here. And he began to, in a way, feel threatened by these Jewish people. And the Bible tells us that he began to enslave them. 
Well, God had already warned them that they would be enslaved. He begins, God begins to tell them that they would be, that this is the prophecy, Genesis 15, 13. You can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Here, God is warning them, you came into this land, you were welcomed into this land because of Joseph. Joseph went through trial after trial after trial. He suffered, but in the midst of his suffering, he was fruitful. And as a result, his whole family benefited and flourished because he responded with his suffering with fruitfulness. His, fruitfulness, his suffering would not be wasted, dear friend. And God does not want to waste your suffering as well. It was going to be fruitful suffering. They would emerge from Egypt with great wealth and great in number. Listen to how Joseph suffered. Let's kind of recap all the ways that he suffered. He suffered the abuse of his brother's jealousy. He suffered as a result of the false accusation of Potiphar's wife that put him in prison. He suffered from being forgotten in prison for many years before he emerged to be second in command in the nation. But when he was released, he did not leave embittered. That is key, my dear friend. We all have been hit with trials and tribulations that we never dreamed would ever touch our lives. And my question to you is, will you be fruitful or will you be embittered? Will you be like Joseph and have so many blessings that you can pass on to others because of your pain that you turned into fruitfulness? Or will you stunt your growth with bitterness? That is the question I have for you. Will you be bitter at God? Will you be bitter at the people who maybe took the life of someone that you loved? Or will you ultimately look at God and say, blessed be the name of the Lord? Well, in fact, Joseph, he chose to celebrate what God did through his suffering. Did you know that he named his sons these very interesting names that represented the suffering that he experienced? He named his oldest son Manasseh. And this is what Manasseh means. God has made me forget all of my troubles. Then he named his second son Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. That's found in Genesis 41. Joseph was, Joseph was able to look at his suffering and see that it was not wasted. He was fruitful. God was accomplishing something good through all the heartache, through all the hardship, and through all the pain that Joseph was going through. And God, my dear friend, is accomplishing something in your life that is going to far supersede any pain and suffering that your trial took you through. The blessings, the fruitfulness that he wants to give you are going to far supersede the pain and the agony and the grief that you are going through. So how... How are you responding to your grief, my dear friend? Have you, are you right now in the land of grief and suffering? Well, only God can make you fruitful in your suffering. 1 Peter 5.10 says this, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's what God wants to do with your suffering, my dear friend. He wants to make you strong, firm, and steadfast. He wants to restore you, my dear friend. If we keep following the story of the nation of Israel, we see that God didn't stop here with his blessings. He continued to take the fruitfulness of Joseph and pour out blessings. Listen to this, dear friends. This is many centuries later. 2 Samuel 7, 9 through 13. I have been with you. This is God speaking to the nation of Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all of your enemies before you. Now you will make my name great, like the names... Oh, I'm sorry. He says, now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own. Remember, they were wandering. They were cast in and out of captivity. So they will no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did in the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. Listen to this, my dear friend, and I will give you rest over your enemies. Who is your enemy today? Is despair your enemy? Is depression your enemy? Is poverty your enemy? Is death your enemy? Is addiction your enemy? 
I want you to know that God wants to give you rest over your enemy as he gave rest to these Israelites. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you, just as he established for the nation of Israel. When your days are over and rest, and you rest with your ancestors, it, the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the, ju the judgment. All of this will rest with our ancestors. You have loved ones, the loved ones that have gone on before you. One day you will rest with them. What will happen to your offsprings? Listen to what God wants to do with your offsprings. I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He's talking about the the nation of Israel, and he's specifically talking about King David, who God was now using to usher in his kingdom. So what did God, what does God give this suffering nation of Israel? Much more than they could ever, ever imagine. Let's kind of recap here. He said to them, I will cut off your enemies. The ones who had enslaved you for 400 years, they will be gone. You will see them no more. What enemies in your life do you need to be seen gone and no more? God also told them, your name will be great, the greatest on earth. He will also provide a place for these people so they can have a home of their own and will no longer be disturbed. Number four, the wicked will no longer oppress them. He would give them rest. And number five, most importantly, through these people, God would raise up one of their offspring to establish his kingdom and his throne would be established forever. The temporary king was David. The eternal king is Jesus. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to the power that works in you, dear friend, if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you have power. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. That means to your children, your grandchildren, your great, great, great grandchildren. God wants to bless your lineage for generations to come. This is his heart towards you, my dear friend. So this person I'm talking about through whom the greatest fruitfulness came was Jesus himself. Instead of building a kingdom for these people who had been enslaved, persecuted, and beat down, God planned to make a kingdom out of these people through the person of Jesus Christ. And this kingdom would be the ultimate fruitfulness of these people. God had promised a spiritual house, a kingdom, an eternal home for these people and for you, my dear friend, for all nations, for all times to come. Ephesians 2, 19 through 20 says this, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So Jesus is building something, but it is not a building of a brick and mortar. It is a building of flesh and blood. And Jesus is the cornerstone. And on top of Jesus, all of you and I are being built as living stones, building up this beautiful kingdom called the body of Christ. How is he going to accomplish this? Well, Jesus, he is the greater Joseph. Joseph was sent into captivity. Jesus was sent into captivity. Jesus was killed. He was betrayed, but Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Hebrews 5, 8, 9 says, though he was a son, talking about Jesus, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of of eternal salvation to all who believe and trust in him. That is your, your hope. What is given to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you have never experienced an eternal life with Christ, a relationship with him, he says, not only did I save you for eternity, to come live with him in eternity, but he says, I've saved you for the here and now. I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. If you don't know this life abundant, if you don't have the salvation, this eternal life, would you please call the prayer line? Somebody's waiting to talk to you. 915-532-8518. Someone would love to lead you. It's called the sinner's prayer. 
and they want to lead you into a relationship with Jesus that will change you forever. It doesn't mean that it takes away all your problems, but it means that when you go through your problems, you are not alone. You now have that the power of the Holy Spirit to equip you, and He turns all of those problems, those trials, those burdens into blessings that you never ever could imagine that could come out of those burdens. My dear friend, you are a part of God's grand plan for this world. In this world where foundations crumble so easily, you can find your security by being built into this spiritual house and kingdom. Like I mentioned, call the prayer line so you can join this family because Christ is the cornerstone and he wants you to be one of those living stones of the building that he is wanting to build to bring his kingdom down to earth. Well, you may be thinking this. You may be thinking, well, I'm not making much of a difference. Yes, you are, my dear friend. Let me share with you a couple of my friends that their life seems so normal and ordinary. If you were to walk by them in a restaurant or drive by them in a car, there's nothing spectacular about them. You wouldn't look at them and say, wow, what giants of the faith, what pillars, what pillars of godliness. But let me tell you about these friends. They are suffering tremendous pain and anguish and agony on almost a daily basis. But in the midst of their suffering, they are fruitful. Let me tell you about my friend Amy. In the midst of her daughter suffering with an immobilizing illness that she has suffered for 10 years that the doctors still have not been able to resolve, she has been fruitful in her suffering. In the midst of this, her whole family has taken in two children, one for Korea, from Korea, and one from China. And they've adopted two precious children, one that was left on the streets to die. These children were abandoned. They were not loved. They were not valued. And she came in and she said, come to my home. She opened up her heart and she opened up her home and she began to love them. In the midst of her suffering, she was fruitful. She opened up her home and she gave life to ones who were dying without any hope. Amy is suffering but is being fruitful. She is building up. She is one of those living stones of the kingdom of God. Well, what about my friend Sylvia? My friend Sylvia has not only suffered her own physical pain, but her twin sister had an accident 20 years ago and has been immobilized for 20 years. Sylvia has taken care of her sister through agonizing pain. And just this last week, my friend Sylvia was going into a store and she came out and three men from Venezuela approached her. They had nowhere, nothing. They were desperate. She looked at them. She didn't look at them with contempt or disgust. They were very dirty. They had not showered. They had no clean clothes. But you know what she did? My friend Sylvia grabbed their hands, told them about the love of Jesus, and she prayed there, right then and there with them. They looked at her and could not believe the love they were getting from this woman. They, were, they are out outcasts. They have not been coming into the city in the right way. They've just entered in. Most people ignore them. Most people scorn them. My friend opened up her wallet, knowing that they had no food. She took out her last $30. She gave 10 to one, 10 to another, and 10 to the third. They thanked her. They took a picture together. And she, to this day, is rejoicing that in the midst of her suffering, she is being fruitful. My dear friend Myrna, she has three sons who are all in the law enforcement field. They are all police officers, and you know what the police officers have been facing. She wakes up every morning praying for them for protection for her dear sons. You know, they've experienced so much hatred and so much antagonism. They go out to protect us, and she protects them through her prayers. But, and through her suffering of watching her sons go through the pain and agony that they have been through, my friend has turned her suffering into fruitfulness. Guess what she does? She goes into the prisons where these criminals themselves have scorned her sons and she shares the gospel with them. She prays with them. She loves on them. She shares the gospel in truth. And my friend has led them to the one who can forgive them and give them a new life. She is experiencing fruitfulness in her suffering. And then there's my dear parents, 78 years old, missionaries in Mexico. My dad has been through so many surgeries. We call him the bionic man. He had cancer on his head and it took them 18 hours to get rid of it and reconstruct his skull. You will see his head when he takes off his hat and he has scars all over his head. 
but he thinks about the scars of the one who died for him. And he says, I will never give up. I will keep serving Jesus till the day I die. So him and my mom get into their car every single Sunday morning and they drive across the border. And where you see the words, La Biblia es la verdad de Leala, on top of the mountain, the Bible is the truth, read it. Right underneath it, how ironic is this, is one of the worst neighborhoods in all of Juarez. There are gunshots going off continuously all night long. There are drugs. It is a very violent neighborhood. But God has called my parents. They are loving God and loving the people more than their own safety. And at 78 years old, they are taking their suffering and turning it into fruitfulness as they share the gospel. And children are coming to the Lord. Their parents are coming to the Lord. And they are receiving Christ. And they are leading others to Him through their suffering. My dear friend, there's also Terry. Terry lives with chronic pain in her jaw and in her bones, and yet she ministers to her neighborhood. In her neighbor, in neighborhood is a man who's going through divorce who has you know, two young children that he has to raise on his own. My friend Terry and her husband went to Washington, D.C. They packed up this man's home and helped him move everything to El Paso. She's taking her suffering, and she's turning it into a blessing and creating incredible fruitfulness. She is fruitful in her suffering. If I were to sit with each one of you, each one of you would have a story of suffering, a great story of anguish and sorrow and pain and heartache. But my dear friend, Jesus wants to take all of that and turn it into fruitfulness. He wants to give you so many abundant blessings through your pain that you would not even be able to contain them. It makes me think of the little boy who brought his five loaves of bread and three fish, three little fishes to Jesus. And Jesus took it and he fed thousands. Today, take your suffering. Take it like the little boy took the little lunch to Jesus and let Jesus feed thousands with your pain and anguish and suffering. Let him minister. Let him minister to those in your life that need hope. Because even in the midst of your suffering, at least you have one thing, and that's Jesus. And you have the hope that your God will never leave you nor forsake you. Your God will never abandon you. He loves you with an everlasting love. You are more than conquerors through him that loved you. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. You have been chosen. You are sanctified. You are set apart. And God has equipped you for a great work that he wants to do in and through you. Jesus laid his, down his life for you. And my dear friend, he wants you to lay down your suffering, to lay down your life so that others may live. So what is your suffering today? Have you lost your marriage? Have you lost your husband? Isaiah 54, 5 says, For your maker is your husband. The Lord of God, the Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is, is your redeemer, my friend. The God of the whole earth, he called you. God is your husband. And because of that, you can be fruitful. Have you lost your income? Philippians 4.19 says, God says, and my God, he himself will supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. He says he will provide everything you need. It's amazing when you need something, you pray and it, and it just God provides. That is who our God is. He says that if he takes care of the sparrows and he notices that when the sparrow falls to the earth, how much more will he care for you, his dearly beloved child with, for whom Christ died? The sparrow does not have a soul, but you have a soul for whom Christ died. How much more does he care for you? So because of that, in the midst of your lack of having finances, you can still be fruitful and you can trust him to provide all of your needs. Has your heart been broken by betrayal or trauma or abandonment? Psalm 147.3 says this, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. And because of that, you, my dear friend, can be fruitful. Jesus is the one who will never leave you. You can be abandoned by anybody and everybody but there is one who will never abandon you, one who will never traumatize you, never, one who will never, ever wound you. Sometimes you are wounded because it brings about healing. Sometimes we are wounded by people out of spite and anger and hatred. That pain inflicts, 
that wounding inflicts pain. Jesus' pain brings healing to our souls if we will turn it and release it and give it over to him. So my dear friend, I want to challenge you that you can be fruitful in suffering. I want to conclude with one more story. It's the story of Amy Carmichael. She was a missionary in India. And she went over there as a single missionary, never married. She called. She said the Lord called her husband. He just never had enough courage to come to India to marry her. But she rescued thousands of children from temple prostitution. She was building a hospital at the very, uh, maybe she was maybe 50 years old. And she was walking through the, the area where they were building the hospital. And she fell into one of the areas that they were constructing the hospital, the, one of the basements. And she fell in and she broke her leg and she distorted her hip. And from the, for the last 20 years of her life, she sat in her room, in her house, and never left it. Did she just throw up her hands and say, well, I can't walk, I can't do anything anymore? Or did she decide that she would be fruitful in her suffering? Did you know that she wrote most of her books? She, this was called the room of prayer, the room of peace. And everyone who walked into Amy Carmichael's room for those last 20 years of her life where she was bedridden experienced incredible fruitfulness, incredible peace and joy in her presence because she chose to take her suffering and turn it into fruitfulness. My dear friend, let me pray for you. I don't know what you're going through, but God knows what you're going through. And if you would like prayer, please call the prayer line. They are waiting to talk with you, to pray with you, and to help you see that God can take every bit of pain you've gone through and turn it into something incredibly beneficial and productive that will bless all the people around you. So let me pray for you, dear friend. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person that's listening. Thank you that you love them with an everlasting love that you have watched every single trial and challenge and difficulty and painful, agonizing grief that they have gone through. You have not been distant. You have been near. You have been close to them. You love them and you want to help them to turn their tragedy into a triumph. You want them to be fruitful and to turn it into something that glorifies you. Give them eyes to see and ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.